Hello. The episode you're about to listen to is part of a multi-part series introducing an overview of Japanese history. This is a repeat of one of the original projects the History of Japan podcast was built on, and is intended to serve as an update and supplement to these original works. After 10 years, my hope is to return to this approach and to do it a little bit better given the skills that I have improved in the intervening years. If you haven't been doing so already, you should listen to these episodes sequentially, starting with episode 501. Without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome to the History of Japan podcast, episode 505, The More Things Change. The academic Ross Bender said of Japan in the 8th century, the 700s, in other words, that, quote, the 8th century represents a critical period for later Japanese culture, an era whose institutions and ways of thinking helped shape the rest of Japanese history. And he's absolutely right to say this. Our basic narrative of Japanese history so far, which has largely been focused on the lives of the elite, but that can't really be helped given the sources available to us, let's follow a pretty clear pattern. In the 6th century, so the 500 CE, the Yamato Kingdom ran into its first major setbacks at home and abroad after several centuries of largely unchecked expansion from its home base in what's now Nara Prefecture. As we've seen over the last couple of episodes, the kingdom, both its emperors and the powerful Omuraji, or clan chieftains who helped govern it, responded with a series of reforms intended to strengthen the dynasty. In particular, starting in the 600s, those reforms became increasingly shaped by models from the Asian mainland and especially imperial China, where the new Tang dynasty was rapidly expanding its power and wealth. Those reforms were also piecemeal. While it can be historically convenient to center the so-called Taika reforms of 645 into our discussions of the era, the reality is more of a series of a la carte reforms, if you will, both before and after that year. Frankly, it's hard for me at least to avoid the impression of a leadership that is simultaneously building the ship of state and trying to navigate it, a fraught proposition to say the least. While many of the reforms of this time were impressive and important, they were also decidedly mixed in terms of track record. After all, the system was not what you would call stable. The first period of reform was ushered in by the Soga clan after they crushed their opponents in the civil war and succession dispute in 587. The second took place after a coup d'etat and assassination plot by anti-Soga forces in 645. And Emperor Tenmu, who took office in 673 and inaugurated yet more reforms, was only able to do so by first launching a civil war and deposing his own nephew. This is not, on balance, what you would call an approach for stable government by any stretch of the imagination. The story of the 8th century, then, is the story of continued reform, further attempts to expand the power of the imperial throne in order to solidify the hold of its rulers over their territory. But here, too, success was not guaranteed, and setbacks abounded. In his own essay on this period, Naoki Kojiro identifies three distinct eras of reform during this time. The first was undertaken by the victorious Emperor Tenmu and his spouse and successor, Empress Jito, during the final decades of the 600s. Tenmu and Jito, having risen together thanks to the succession dispute that became a full-sale civil war, egged on by the interests of powerful competing clans, concerned themselves primarily with trying to weaken and control those very clans as much as possible, to ensure that similar things could not happen in the future. After all, the very same clans which put them into power could turn on them as well. Thus, when he took the throne, Emperor Tenmu did his very best to centralize administration under himself and his allies. Previous emperors had relied on powerful clan leaders who filled the administrative positions of Udaijin and Sadaijin, or ministers of the right and left, and oversaw the management of the state. One of Tenmu's major reforms was the creation in 689 of the position of Daijo Daijin, or Grand Chancellor, 
a position he granted only to members of his extended family or trusted advisors. The powers of the two ministers of the left and right were further restricted by the Nagon, or Counselor, a sort of imperial secretary responsible for implementing the emperor's will, and who in so doing could serve as a check on the ministers of the left and right. Tenmu was also separately advised by his wife and successor Jito, who, though she didn't have an official position during Tenmu's reign, obviously had a great deal of power and influence at court as her husband's spouse and one of his closest advisors. The administrative structures put into place by Tenmu and Jito were, simply put, designed to make it easier for the emperor to control those who were supposed to advise him, while still maintaining the existing positions of Sadaijin and Udaijin as gifts that could be given to powerful clan leaders to keep them complacent. The two rulers also worked hard to strengthen the religious foundations of the imperial state. This is something that is, I think, a bit hard for us to conceptualize today. The idea that the spiritual foundations of a state are as important as the hard realities of politics, economics, or military power sits a bit strangely with our modern perspective. But for the imperial clan, so much of its legitimacy was predicated on what we would call religious justification. For example, as we covered last week, it was Tenmu who began the practice of referring to the emperor as Nakitsugami, or living god, and Jito, who adopted the term we now use for emperor, Tenno, or heavenly sovereign, specifically to give the position a connotation of divine power. Tenmu also began the practice of grading the nation's shrines, with higher grades reserved for shrines more closely associated with the imperial line, and the highest position reserved for Ise Shrine in what's now Mie Prefecture, dedicated to Amaterasu the sun goddess from whom the imperial line was supposedly descended. It was also Tenmu who began the practice of sending imperial relatives to serve in positions at that shrine, and in particular, of dedicating women from the imperial family to the role of shrine priestess, and sending imperial heirs there to worship on the emperor's behalf, reinforcing the connection between Amaterasu and the imperial clan. In addition to the focus put on Japan's traditional gods, Tenmu and Jito also began to step up state sponsorship of Buddhism. Before their reign, temples were generally supported by individuals or clan groups. For example, Asukadera in Nara would serve as the family temple for the Soga clan, which would maintain the temple in exchange for its priests offering prayers to the Buddha on their behalf, the karmic merit of which would partially accrue to the Soga clan. It's a bit strange to think about it this way because in the West we tend to have a view of Buddhism as anti-materialistic, influenced very heavily by Zen, but this kind of aristocratic Buddhism was, in a sense, very much oriented towards being able to pay someone else for the labor of prayer, in essence, farming out one's spiritual well-being. Tenmu and Jito revised this practice and began to directly sponsor temples themselves. For example, in the very first year of Tenmu's reign, he massively expanded the nation's first imperially sponsored temple, the Kudara no Odera, and moved it to the site of his own palace. Eventually, he renamed the temple Daikan Daiji, the Temple of the Great Official, a reference to himself. Today it's known as Daianji, one of the seven great temples of the city of Nara. Tenmu also began the practice of offering stipends to the priests of those old clan temples, like Asukadera, on the condition, of course, the priests also offer prayers that would benefit the imperial family. Viewed as a whole, it's clear the goal of imperial religious policy was to use religion to give the imperial family as much legitimacy as possible and to strengthen the prestige of the imperial clan not to mention offering its spiritual aid against any misfortunes which could come its way. Tenmu and Jito's leadership also saw the substantial revision of Japan's legal and administrative code, a process that had already begun before their reign, but which substantially picked up after Tenmu's victory in 672. Those codes collectively laid out a model known to history as the Ritsuryo system, Ritsu being the character for civil and Ryo for administrative, meaning the Ritsuryo system laid out the basis for managing civil and administrative affairs. 
Once again, this was a system that took shape over decades. I don't think it makes sense for us to go through each of the various edicts creating it, rather than looking at a system holistically. Broadly, the Ritsurio system laid out a pattern of government administration which would remain in place for centuries, and which in modified form would continue to operate until the 1800s, though for the last half a millennium or so it was entirely ceremonial. Still, that makes it pretty important for us to consider. Broadly, the system set up a central government under the control of the emperor divided into two parts. The first was the Dajolkan, or Council of State. The second was the Jingikan, or Council of Religious Affairs. We're far more concerned with the former, of course, which was dominated by the Grand Chancellor, followed by the Minister of the Left, and then the Right. So Daijol Daijin, Sadaijin, then Udaijin. After them, it came for Dainagon, or Senior Counselors. Collectively, they oversaw eight ministries, which were Central Affairs, Personnel, Civil Affairs, Popular Affairs, War, Justice, Treasury, and the Imperial Household, with the Minister of the Left overseeing the first four and the right the second four. They also managed a few other government units, like the Imperial Palace Guard. The Code also outlined systems for tribute collection and for military conscription, because Japanese armies were still conscripted at this point, and most importantly delineated the 60 traditional provinces of Japan, which sometimes are still referenced in historical or poetic allusions, though they were replaced more than a century ago by the prefecture system. Of course, one of the biggest markers of imperial power was a shift in the way the capital itself was constructed. As we discussed last week, up until this point in Japanese history, the position of imperial capital had rotated on a semi-regular basis, for reasons that are not entirely clear. But starting in the 600s, there was a shift towards constructing grander and less temporary capital complexes. After the 645 coup, the new leadership constructed larger imperial palaces based on the model of Chinese emperors in the Tang Dynasty capital of Chang'an. Under the reign of Jito in particular, the government constructed a brand new capital at Fujiwara-kyo, today Kashihara in Nara Prefecture, the first intentionally built on a Chinese model. If you don't know what it means to build a capital on a Chinese model, well, like the ancient Romans, Chinese imperial city planners liked a good street grid system running north-south and east-west. They also liked a good bit of symbolic architecture, with a massive palace complex on the north end of the city and a primary entrance to the south. One of the symbols of imperial authority in China was having a ruler sit facing to the south, with that symbol being so powerful that in both the Chinese and Japanese languages, pointing south is still used as a term for giving instructions to someone. Fujiwara-kyo was constructed on this model with a massive scale for the time. The capital was 3.2 kilometers from north to south and 2.1 kilometers from east to west, so 2 and 1.3 miles respectively in freedom units, with an estimated population of 60 to 70,000. Jito and her successor Monmu would reign from this capital for decades until Monmu's death in 707. After Monmu's death, Fujiwara-kyo was abandoned as the capital yet again for reasons that are not entirely clear. Instead, the court relocated to the south, to a new capital known as Heijol-kyo, the capital of the peaceful citadel, known better today as Nara. Once again, this new capital was constructed on the model of the imperial capital of Chang'an, with the same north-south and east-west facing roads. Indeed, several of Nara's roads continued directly into the avenues and boulevards of the old Fujiwara-kyo. Nara outgrew the old capital by leaps and bounds. At its height in the mid-700s, the city probably had more than 200,000 residents. It also became a center of religious authority for the throne, replete with massive Buddhist temples, including the Seven Great Temples of Nara, about which more in a bit, as well as more traditional shrines. The new capital, simply put, was intended once again to be a symbol of the power and authority of Japan's emperors. As a side note, this is also around the time those histories we've been relying on, Kojiki and Nihon Shoki, were first compiled, with the specific intent of strengthening the hand of the emperors and legitimating their rule. However, here's the thing. All of these attempts to further strengthen the power of the emperors, well, we're not entirely sure they worked. 
You see, when an emperor took ill, it was customary for shrines and temples to offer prayers for their recovery, which were recorded in the histories of the court for posterity. Monmu didn't get any of this and died very suddenly and did so at the tender age of 23, which has led to suspicions that he was assassinated. Of course, we don't know that for sure, that's the thing about a well-executed assassination, but certainly there are reasons to be suspicious, particularly because there was someone well-positioned to benefit from his untimely demise. You see, remember back last episode when we talked about the coup in 645 against the Soga? It was led by an imperial prince, Nakano Oe, the future emperor Tenji, but also one of the anti-Soga clan chieftains, named Nakatomi no Kamatari. After the coup succeeded, Kamatari was showered in honors, one of which was a new and more regal-sounding family name for himself and his successors, Fujiwara, roughly Wisteria Meadow. The newly renamed Fujiwara family was naturally closely allied to the new leadership of the imperial family, with that alliance being cemented by a series of intermarriages, particularly with emperors taking Fujiwara wives and concubines. As a result, when Emperor Monmu died young, one of the foremost candidates to succeed him was his six-year-old son Prince Obito, great-grandson of Fujiwara no Kamatari. The current head of the Fujiwara family, Fujiwara no Fuhito, obviously favored his candidacy. One might even suspect he'd been behind arranging for this little opening in the line of succession in the first place. Indeed, as one of the three Dainagon, or Grand Chancellors, he did have the influence to advance his preferred candidate, a motive for removing the previous emperor to speed things along, shall we say. Of course, we can't prove that's what happened. Still, if that was the goal of Fujiwara no Fujito, he did not succeed right away. There were enough other powerful families at court to frustrate his ambition to have Prince Obito crowned. Histories like the Nihon Shoki do not record the debates around this moment, Likely, other aristocratic families objected out of a combination of belief that Obito was not suited for the job, since he was not of pure imperial descent but mixed Fujiwara imperial, and out of concern, not unjustified in retrospect, that the Fujiwara were aiming to dominate the government just like the Soga clan before them. Instead, one of the departed Emperor Tenmu's siblings, Empress Genmei, took the throne, though Fuhito was probably encouraged by the fact that Genmei also wanted Prince Obito as her own heir. The first two decades of the 700s were thus politically defined by one more internal power struggle, this time between pro- and anti-Fujiwara forces at court, with the pro-forces aiming to get Obito on the throne and the anti-forces trying to block it. Fujiwara no Fujito would not live to see the final outcome, dying in 720. By that time he had succeeded in getting Obito named Crown Prince, and gotten himself bumped up to Minister of the Right, but when Empress Genmei abdicated in 715, she handed over the throne to her own daughter, Empress Gensho, instead. It's not entirely clear why, the common assumption is that at 15 Obito was considered too young. But his own father, Emperor Monmu, had been 15 when he was enthroned. More likely, this is yet another result of concerns about Fujiwara parentage and influence. What emerged in the aftermath of Fujiwara no Fujito's death was yet another power struggle within the government, once again, between pro- and anti-Fujiwara forces. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because, oh lord, the family trees get very complicated, and to be frank, I have a hard time following them without an actual graphic of the respective family lines in front of me, Polygamy may be great for ensuring you have enough heirs floating around, but god help me does it make things mind-bending for historians trying to keep track of the family tree. The competition got very violent. For example, after Fujiwara no Fujito's death in 720, one of the major figures that emerged into the power vacuum left by his absence was an imperial prince named Nagaya. Prince Nagaya was a grandson of Emperor Tenmu by way of one of Tenmu's sons who had not sat on the throne. He was also very anti-Fujiwara in his politics out of an, again, not unjustified, since the Fujiwara were becoming just as much of a threat to the power and independence of the emperors as the Soga clan had once been. For a time, Prince Nagaya was very successful, taking over Fujiwara no Fuhito's old post as Minister of the Right, 
and standing against further Fujiwara advances at court. But his enmity with the Fujiwara painted a target on his back. In 729, Nagaya was charged with plotting a rebellion against the court, almost certainly based on evidence that had been planted against him, though it's very hard to be sure. Before any further investigation could take place, a Fujiwara son took it upon himself to enact justice by assembling forces to surround Nagaya's palace. Nagaya, knowing he was trapped, committed suicide to avoid capture, as did his entire family. The Fujiwara found other ways to expand their power as well. For example, by the early 700s, Buddhism was a well-established part of Japan's religious fabric, the one largely restricted to the upper classes, because many of the common forms of veneration, like sutra chanting, required both a lot of free time and literacy in Chinese. Still, there were popular forms of Buddhism emerging even at this early moment, though it would take a few more centuries for Buddhism to become truly a religion of the masses. For example, early in its inception, the city of Nara became home to a Buddhist monk named Gyoki, famous for doing something rather unusual, preaching Buddhist law in simple terms to the city's masses. His focus was on simplifying Buddhist teaching into a comprehensible discussion of causality and karmic retribution, basically teaching that you get good from the world by putting good into it and the reverse. Gyoki's teachings became quite popular by the early years of the Nara era, the period where Nara was the capital, and he drew substantial crowds, for which the government banned him from preaching publicly. It's a bit unclear precisely why. The most common theory is that Gyoki's teachings were drawing large numbers of poor farmers from the countryside, who in turn were being encouraged to abandon their own families in favor of cultivation and infrastructure work on behalf of Buddhist temples, an act which accumulated good karma for the farmers who did it. Unfortunately, that also cut into the government's tax base. Those farmers leaving their fields were not generating the tax income the state relied on to operate. However, despite the ban, Gyoki continued to preach, relying quite successfully, as it turned out, on his popularity to protect him from government retribution. By 730, his following was such that tens of thousands of people came to Nara over the course of several days to see him, and members of the Fujiwara clan started to see the value in this guy. The clan, led at this point by four sons of Fujiwara no Fuhito, whose names I will not bother you with because, oh lord, I have thrown a lot of names at you, used its influence to push through new regulations lifting the ban on Gyoki's teachings, and encouraging his followers, at least those too old to work in the fields, to take up roles as Buddhist priests to staff the country's growing number of temples. It's certainly not impossible that this was done out of genuine piety and a belief in Gyoki's ability to spread an important Buddhist message. However, it's hard to escape the feeling that Fujiwara leaders who pushed for this were also hoping for Gyoki's supporters and the temples benefiting from their patronage to feel some sense of indebtedness to the Fujiwara clan. In a somewhat ironic twist, the very same Fujiwara that had overthrown the Soga, who in turn had based part of their power on being patrons of Buddhism, were now securing their own power by patronizing Buddhism themselves. This jockeying for power continued throughout the Nara years, interrupted only by one of the biggest catastrophes in early Japanese history. In 735, a trade ship from Shilla arrived in what's now Osaka, carrying with it the usual trade goods, but also an unknown and deadly passenger. Smallpox is not something we think a lot about today. It's one of the only two diseases that has ever been successfully eradicated by humans thanks to vaccination, and the only one that infects humans, the other one's a cattle disease. Get your shots, people. In its heyday, smallpox was an absolute killer, particularly in populations like Japan up to this point, that had not been exposed to it. In the two-year smallpox epidemic that started in 735, approximately one out of every three people living in Japan died from what we can tell, including all four of those Fujiwara sons and countless other members of the nobility. The court, thrown into disarray not only by the deaths but by the mass migrations of people hoping to escape the disease, which badly interrupted taxation, threw itself into trying to mitigate the epidemic. Unfortunately, the only option they really had was divine intervention, 
Massive resources were poured into constructing new temples and supporting priests, including Gyolki himself, now an officially sponsored monk, praying for the end of the epidemic. In point of fact, one of Nara's greatest temples, Todaiji with its massive Buddha statue, was constructed after the epidemic ended, and almost certainly as a way to accrue karmic merit to the court to protect it from future catastrophes. The devastation of the 735 smallpox epidemic threw Nara into chaos and temporarily set back the Fujiwara stranglehold on power, if for no other reason than the Fujiwara leadership having all died of smallpox. In their absence, other clans rushed to fill the void. In particular, the Tachibana family, led by Tachibana no Moroe, became extremely influential at court. Moroe set about securing his family's hold on power by merrily demoting the remaining Fujiwara relatives and posting them to jobs out in the countryside provinces, far from the center of power at Nara. As you might expect, this created a bit of tension with the surviving Fujiwara leadership, and in 740, one prominent member of the family, Fujiwara no Hirotsugu, took it upon himself to launch a rebellion against the Tachibana, making use of his remote position in Kyushu to rally supporters to himself, far from the center of power. The rebellion ended disastrously for the Fujiwara, with government forces swiftly crushing its army in a single decisive battle in northern Kyushu, but still it was another sign of troubled times. And the times would not get any better over the next few decades. By this point, the Fujiwara prince Obito had finally taken the throne as Emperor Shomu, but everything we've just talked about that was his reign. Rebellions, epidemics, fighting between his advisors, not a great time. The emperor spent a lot of time on tours of the provinces to escape the capital, and attempted repeatedly to relocate the capital out of Nara over the course of the 740s. It's not really clear why again. Theories have ranged from trying to please differing clans by moving the capital around to try to end infighting, to trying to find a site free of the spiritual baggage of the last few decades. Still, it doesn't really matter. The relocation effort was abandoned by 745, basically because of a lack of funding. And despite Emperor Shomu's best efforts for a fresh start, which included dedicating yet more imperial temples to accumulate positive karma on behalf of the state, and upping funding for the existing ones, things kept going downhill. Shomu would eventually abdicate in favor of his daughter, known to history as Empress Kolken, in 749. Kolken is a fascinating figure historically. At first, she was a proxy figure functionally for her own mother, the Empress Consort Komyo, who was extremely politically ambitious but kept from taking the throne after her husband's retirement, likely because she was also of Fujiwara ancestry and close with one of the few remaining prominent members of the Fujiwara family. Fujiwara no Nakamaro. Kolken would remain on the throne for about a decade, serving again largely as a proxy for her mother, Komyo, and for Fujiwara no Nakamaro, as they collectively sidelined their opposition using their control over the throne. For example, Tachibana no Moroe's son was implicated in an assassination plot the year Moroe died, targeting Nakamaro. For his trouble, he was executed. In 758, Kolken was invited to step down in favor of her son, Emperor Junin, who was 29 but apparently kind of a doormat and pliant to management by Komyo and Nakamaro. However, two years later, the Empress Consort Komyo would die, and in her wake, things once again became interesting, which is to say, unstable. The court started to divide around a younger emperor too inexperienced to manage things, with one faction of courtiers following Fujiwara no Nakamaro, and another gathering around the now-retired Empress Kolken. These two, meanwhile, jockeyed for influence over Junnin, a man who, as far as I can tell, had no opinions of his own. Kolken was in turn strongly allied to a Buddhist monk named Dokyo, about whom not much is known. By this point, he was in his 60s, born in the area of modern Osaka from a provincial family. His family had enough money to arrange for him to become a monk at Nara's massive Todaiji, where he caught the eye of Kolkin. Particularly after he was supposedly able to cure her of an illness with his prayers, he became a part of the Empress's inner circle and one of her most trusted advisors. 
As a result of his presence, the growing split between Kolkin and Fujiwara no Nakamaro is often painted as yet another Buddhist-slash-traditional early Japanese religion or Shinto battle, and also as an issue of corruption, with the monk Dokyo manipulating the empress for his own benefit. In reality, it's not entirely clear that Kolken enjoyed unified support from the Buddhist establishment or that Nakamaro was opposed to Buddhism as a faith, and the corruption issue seems to me at least to be yet another example of Chinese-inspired historiography blaming everything bad in history on the role of women in politics. In retrospect, it seems pretty clear to me that what's happening is a power struggle between Kolken and Nakamaro. In his writing on the subject, the historian Delmer Brown suggests this was really a political battle over the nature of the emperorship, with Kolken looking to protect the independent authority of the throne as it had existed since Tenmu Injito had taken over, and Nakamaro hoping to bring the throne under his control and push the emperor into the role of religious figurehead. And certainly going forward, we're going to see plenty more battles in this vein over the question of what the role of the emperor actually was supposed to be. In the end, Kolken won. In 764, Nakamaro attempted a coup d'etat to seize control of the palace at Nara, but Kolken's forces were able to stop him. Nakamaro then tried to flee to the east where his supporters were more numerous, but Kolken's forces caught up with him on the shores of Lake Biwa before he could escape. In the ensuing battle, Fujiwara no Nakamaro was killed, and Empress Kolken's position secured. Now thoroughly in control of the government, Kolken would remove her son from the throne and resume direct rule in her own right, confusingly taking a new Renyal name in the process, though I'm going to keep calling her Empress Kolken. She would reign for five more years until her death at the age of 57, with Dokyo at her side. One of the histories of this period, the Shoku Nihongi, records that at this point there was discussion of making Dokyo a reigning emperor in his own right, a suggestion that Kolken nixed, though she never punished Dokyo, and appeared to believe he had no involvement in the idea. It seemed pretty clear the power of the imperial line had triumphed. Successive emperors had thrown off the rule of the Soga, the Tachibana, and now the Fujiwara, who had tried to control them, and Kolken had sealed a new era of imperial supremacy, atop a far more centralized state than Japan had ever seen, thanks to the reforms of the past century. And then, from nowhere, it all came crashing down. In 770, when Empress Kolken died very suddenly at the age of 52, she had not yet named an heir publicly. Shortly thereafter, a letter was discovered purporting to be from her, and naming an imperial prince named Shirakabe as her successor. However, that letter was almost certainly a forgery, crafted by, wait for it, one of the very few remaining Fujiwara leaders left at the center of power, Fujiwara no Momokawa. Why do we suspect that? Well, here for a second we have to go back in time and talk a bit about family trees. All the emperors I have talked about over the course of this episode were from a single branch of the imperial family which has a pretty extensive family tree thanks to all those concubines male emperors tended to have, that branch was descended from Tenmu and or Jito, the two rulers who put the country back together after the Civil War of 672. This was the branch of the family that had made its mission, or at least that of its most prominent members, protecting and expanding the power of the throne against potential usurpation by powerful clans. However, Prince Shirakabe was from a different branch of the imperial line, the one descended from Emperor Tenji, which did not have quite the same reputation. Fujiwara no Momokawa and his followers were able to use this forged edict to put Shirakabe, also known to history as Emperor Konin, atop the throne, and have a grateful Konin appoint them to key positions in the now more centralized than ever bureaucracy. Hangers on from the previous Kolken period, like that Buddhist priest Dokyo, were booted from office. He specifically was exiled to Shimotsuke province in the remote Kanto plains of the east, never to be heard from again. Once again, the Fujiwara were back in power, and this time they seemed poised to hang on. When Emperor Konin had his first son by an imperial princess descended from the Tenmu slash Jito branch of the family, that princess was promptly framed for something, cursing the emperor to make him besotted with her, 
and demoted, with the young prince being exiled. To replace her, Fujiwara no Momokawa found another descendant of the Tenji branch to provide Konin with an heir, ensuring nobody from the unruly side of the imperial family had a shot at inheriting the throne again. Thus, the Tenmu slash Jito sub dynasty, so to speak, of the imperial line came to a close. Before long, so too did the Nara era. After a century of reform in new Chinese style capitals, the state was stronger than ever before, but also impoverished by constant civil wars and new building projects to support the new religion of Buddhism. And after a chaotic century of imperial restoration, so to speak, it was the Fujiwara, once again, who held the reins of power. You can maybe see why, perhaps, by this time Nara was starting to feel like it had a bit too much baggage as a capital city, and why, once again, the prospect of relocating the capital was brought up. Next time, the capital will move once again, for the last time in a while, thankfully, and a new era of government, associated with some of the greatest cultural flourishing in Japanese history, will emerge. But that's for next time. That's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This show is a part of the Facing Backward podcast network. You can find out more about this show and our other shows at facingbackward.com, and you can support the network at patreon.com slash facingbackward. Special thanks to those who have given at our shout-out tier, Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Cat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, and Anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sai, Gil, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, Harrison Reese, Shimao Toshio's History of Japonesia Podcast, A House is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Are Road Scholars Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next week for part six.